uh, based in, in the city. So what I'll talk about um, is really um, the, our experiences of explaining some of that to the market. And when I say the market, I really mean largely the city, but also all of our clients around the world, uh, from Europe to Asia uh, to, to the US. And before I get into it, it's, it's just amazing just to, to, to be back here. I had some of the, the, the best time of my life when I was here. So, so it's so, so good to be back. I forgot how beautiful it is uh, in the apartment. Um, so, okay, so what are we talking about? So what, what, is, what is CAT modeling? So the way that I describe it is that we're estimating losses from disasters that haven't happened in the past, but uh, can potentially happen in the future. Uh, we do that uh, for reinsurance companies or insurance companies. And why they do that is to set capital, which is also called reserves, so how much money you put in the bank in the case of a, of a disaster, price some kind of policy, an insurance policy or a reinsurance policy, and, and, and many, uh, many other reasons. Um, who do we explain to? So this part's uh, important to set up, you know, just differentiating it to the, to, to the general public in some of the talks earlier. Uh, largely insurance or insurance professionals, uh, many people are technical. Most people we talk to are technical, um, but their background is uh, generally natural hazards, so some kind of uh, sciences. Um, uh, often geography, very, very popular, uh, and, then, and then engineering as well. Very few people would have studied uh, degree level maths. So when we're explaining, uh, I'll go into that uh, a little bit more. When we, when we talk about maths, it, it, it often doesn't, doesn't resonate. Um, what are we explaining? We explain many things, many models, hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and all sorts of stuff. Um, largely here, I was just limited to probabilistic losses uh, over a one-year time horizon. Um, and those losses are the losses that the insurance company or the reinsurance company uh, might, might experience. I'll digress for one example, but, but largely between losses, just to make it sim simple. Um, how do we explain? So I'll talk about some five tools. Um, which is something that I use when, expa when explaining things and it's often used in the, in, the, in the industry. Not all five tools are really used that, that, that often. So the first one is maths and it's example. You can use an image, you can have a story, or you can de do a demonstration. Mostly example and image are probably the two ones that are used more, but I'll, I'll get into that uh, in, in a second. Uh, and then um, what I'll do uh, after that is I'll talk about some challenges that we experience as an industry, explaining things to, to, to the market. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about successful and unsuccessful <coughs> communication. I was asked to really talk um, maybe any recommendations from what we find works and doesn't work from when, when we're explaining things. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll comment on some of that as well. Okay, so w what is a CAT model? So just to, just to repeat, right? So CAT models are models that are estimating losses that haven't happened in the past but can potentially happen in the future. It's done for insurance and, and, and reinsurance largely. So imagine here you have um, some historical uh, hurricane uh, that's just shown by um, that, that track there, and then you have a few more, a few more historical hurricanes. Assume then you take that data and you build some model, right? Um, uh, most catastrophe models are hybrid statistical physical models, so assume that you take some statistics from these historical events, uh, put some physics into it, and then create some simulation. Estimations of hurricanes, tens of thousands of hurricanes haven't happened in the past, that can happen uh, in the future. And then now assume you're, like, let's say an insurance company. Um, and so if you're an insurance company, um, you have uh, exposures, which are really locations uh, around, uh, let's say you have those locations around the, U the US. So you're insuring houses across the US, you intersect those events with those houses, you get some losses, and then that's really what you're using. That's what we're trying to explain. What are these losses? How do they, where do they come from? How do you interpret them? Um, and, and, and so on. And so from that, the main single output that you would get uh, from, a, from a CAT model or a catastrophe model is what's called an exceedance probability curve, which I'm sure uh, many of you have heard. And this is really the, the, the main output. If you want to think of one output, what's the one thing you get? It's, it's this. And so really, I'll just explain this as this is just a setup for, for some of the, the, the future slides. So the x-axis is, is exceedance probability or return period, and then the y-axis is, is loss. So if you insure the insurance loss, if you reinsure the, the, the reinsurance loss. And then as you go to the right, things are less likely, so more losses. And as you go to the left, it's more likely, so you have less losses. Um, and then if you look at a single point, like that 5% point, really what it's saying is that the probability that you get a loss of 1 million or greater in a given year is about 5%. And you'll see that there below the 5%, I put 20. And 20 is the, is the return period. And I'll get to that point in a second, but you'll see um, uh, that, that I've referenced both the exceedance probability and the corresponding uh, return period. 
And then the last thing, uh, last bit of jargon, um, uh, just to set up, is then what we also do is then you compute this thing called the average annual loss. Average annual loss is the amount you expect to lose every year on average. And you use that thing to um, work out how, how you should price a policy, for example, how much you should charge before you add on other things. And that's essentially the area under that, uh, that exceedance probability curve. Okay, so now I'll talk about, um, now that I've set it up and you have an idea of what we're talking about, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the five tools. Um, and so this is something uh, that, 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 that I said I, I, I use, I used to um, think about this when I was tutoring maths back in, back in Trinidad as a teenager. I was found that there must be multiple ways to explain things. So I, I, I put up these, these five tools and as I said, mostly we only use some of them. It would be good if we could, if we could use some more. And then if, um, I wrote about it on Plus, it's nice to see Marianne and Rachel uh, talking uh, to, tomorrow. So what are, these, what are these five tools? I'll just explain them a little bit more. So in this example, I'll talk about convolution. So convolution is when you combine probability distributions and you use them because let's say you have some, because cat models are very uncertain, as you can imagine. Um, so you have some uncertainty in the loss, let's say from one location and from another location. So what's the uncertainty and loss from two locations combined? You, you, you would use convolution for that. Now, as I said, you can do some, some math. So when we write that uh, documentation about the models, which are hundreds of pages are long, there'll be some maths in it, and, and, and you can see that. As I said, almost never resonates. Uh, the thing that resonates uh, almost always, the thing that works the best is some kind of example, right? So you know this, um, this example from um, those of you that have, many of you would have seen this before, you have two, uh, two dice, you roll two dice, what's the score on the two dice? And then yeah, a seven is the most common because there's, there's uh, many combinations of getting a seven, a one and a six, a two and a five, three and four and so forth. And so you give an example and that example highlights how convolution works because really you're, you're trying to find the total score on two dice, it's kind of like the probability distribution of loss for two locations for, uh, for some hypothetical event. So you give an example. What I've noticed is when we do these examples, so this is very common in, in, in the city, you have some policy, you don't know how it works. It, it only ever works if you do it uh, arithmetically. Um, when we try to explain things probabilistically, you say, well, this distribution has this shape and it gets truncated, it, 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 it doesn't work. Um, it, it's always best to figure out a way to explain it arithmetically. Um, people, people get that, minuses, pluses, and so forth. Um, the other thing is, of course, you accompany it by an image. We use this quite a lot too, so you, you know, this is really just saying if you can evolve to uniform distributions, uh, this is the kind of shape of the, of, of the resulting uh, that, that you get. Now the last two are, are story and demonstration. And so it's kind of like, um, th th this example is a, is a little bit different. So in this example, what, what commonly happens is that you need to explain this concept of resonance of buildings. So this is a story in the late 80s in Mexico um, where there was an earthquake, um, and it was quite far from Mexico City, uh, hundreds of kilometers of the earthquake um, translated that, that distance and then caused some apartment buildings, quite a lot, to resonate, essentially amplitude became quite high, they collapsed uh, and, uh, and, and people died. That, is, that story, that concept is, is really important because it's, um, it's important to then know if you're ensuring buildings of certain heights, how they can then impact the different types of earthquakes. So you can then tell people a story and explain it through, th through that. So for example, you can say, well imagine you're you know, pushing your, your, your child on a swing and you know, the, the, the way that that swing oscillates back and forth, that it has a, you know, a natural uh, way that, that it oscillates. If you then hit it every time it comes back, exactly every time the amplitude is going to increase each time. Um, and that's a way that you can explain that if the earthquake um, you know, frequency is similar to the natural frequency of the building, it's a large amp uh, amplitude. That's, that's, that's one way you can do it. Another way um, that we can do it, and you rarely have a have chance to, to, to do this, is really, you know, this is my son's uh, Lego Duplo when he was four years old. And so you can shake it in, in, in different ways, and you can see that depending on the height of the building, that fast shaking I did there um, didn't really do anything um, when, when the building was, was more tall. But when the building was shorter, I did this fast shaking, and then it shook, it shook a lot, right? So that's another way that you can do demonstration. Savvy, there isn't very much um, ways to, to, to um, get the market to... Uh, together to do that, but whenever we do that at conferences, it's, it's, it's the most memorable and, and people talk about it for, for years. <laughs> so, um, 
the, 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 the next point I want to talk about really is more the meat of, uh, of, of the discussion, which is really the challenges that we have when communicating risk metrics. And so number one is something I, I alluded to um, earlier, and, and, and bits of it were alluded to in previous talks. The market often thinks in return periods and not exceedance probabilities, and that can lead to, to misinterpretation. Um, uh, when I say the market, as I mentioned, I really mean the, the insurance market, the, uh, the city here, but also the, the, wider, the wider market. Um, I'll explain why, why, why I think that happens uh, in a second. The second is the assumptions around written periods can get lost. So if you think about um, the summer floods in uh, Central Europe in 2021, there were lots of written periods you might have heard on the news. So the written period of this catchment, written period of this river, written period of, of this region, written period in Germany, you know, there were many, many things going on. Uh, sometimes I, I think written periods are probably quoted too, um, too many times. Um, maybe written periods should be at a very low resolution. So that is at a, at a large extent rather than zooming in. Uh, otherwise, you, 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 people, um, it can be misinterpreted uh, quite a lot. Another one is, is using loss exceedance risk metrics only can, can mislead and can lead to counterintuitive results. So you have one way of, of telling the risk. I showed that just now, the exceedance probability curve. And um, sometimes what happens is, well, you can imagine if you're insuring, if you're reinsuring, you're insuring two companies. Um, those companies, if you look at them, well, the, the risk metrics could be the same. Are they given exceedance probability? You will then say, well, they have the same loss. Of course, that's, that, that's not true. Uh, if you look at the tail, like the tail value of risk, you could see that there is uh, one's more risky than, than the other one. Another one that happens is framing risks over just one year can, lead, can, can mislead the perception of the risk. The way the insurance industry does it is that everything is over one year because policies are written over one year. Uh, as you, you, you probably know, pretty much all insurance policies are renew, renew every year. Uh, and and that, can, uh, that can mislead the perception of the risk. Um, you, you can end up thinking um, that the risk is a certain amount, but if you compound it over 10 years and so forth, uh, that, can, that, that can change things. Um, we talked about uncertainty a lot in previous talks. Um, there's a desire for a single number, and sometimes uncertainty can be unhelpful to show. Uh, some cultures, and by cultures, I don't necessarily mean countries, I mean business cultures, uh, are more comfortable with, with uncertainty. But what can sometimes happen is that we'll show uncertainty, so the, the, the software and the, the models and so forth, they have exceedance probabilities, they have you know, uncertainties around them and, and, and so on. Um, and then they'll say, yeah, but I really just need one number. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll say, well, you know, you need to account for all the uncertainties and you need to take that into account. And it's like, yeah, but I only have one number to put the capital in the bank. I can only charge one premium. There is really only one number at the end. Um, and so, uh, you know, more sophisticated companies are, feel more comfortable, but some, sometimes it's, it's, it's paralyzing for them. Um, the other part is it needs to be clear what's actually represented in the, in, in the results. Um, I think this was alluded to as well in, in a previous talk, you know, so you don't compare um, apples and oranges, what's modeled, what's not modeled. And, and the last point is, is on climate change. Climate change um, is, is a very, very big topic. Uh, in the insurance industry and, and, and the wider world, so lots of work are being done right now on it. Uh, when you communicate climate change metrics, um, often what I find is that assumptions and uncertainties uh, get lost. You just get a number and then that gets communicated and, and, and you forget what, what was in it. The other part is that the future change can be hard to interpret now. So you'll say, well, here's my loss now, here's my loss in 2050. And then you get a bit, a bit confused about how to then um, you know, compare the two. And I'll, I'll explain um, a, a, a better way of doing that. So the return period side, um, this is, this is a, a, a common uh, example. So Katrina was a 1 in 20 year hurricane loss for the US. So you know, maybe um, some market participants think if it happened in 2005, it may not happen again until, until 2025. And of course, the better way to uh, explain that is that there's about a 5% annual probability that a Katrina-sized hurricane loss or greater could occur in the U.S. So that's a, that's a more precise way. It doesn't, that may not necessarily be as, 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 as conversational and easy, easy, to, um, easy to say, but that's a more precise way of doing it. As I said, I don't actually think um, a, a, anyone in the market thinks like that, though. If you put the 5%, they will always invert it. 105%, 20 years. So they'll say it's a 20-year return period. I think the reason that happens is because if you, th you can think about our lifetime, so we live for you know, 70, 80, 90 years, you think very much in years. Years feels intuitive to you, so you, can, you feel comfortable. The percent is it, hard to touch and feel. Um, 
So we, we, we try to stop using return proofs and only use in prop probabilities. I would say we, that that battle is lost. So we use both now, return probabilities and, and return periods. Um, in terms of, of tail losses, so this is just, I'm just alluding to a little bit three or four examples of what, what I mentioned um, before. So of course, as I said, insurance industry thinks of over one year. So if you think, well, I have 153 billion uh, US dollar loss, that's a 1% exceedance probability. But you're just thinking about one year. What about if you compound it over, over 10 years, you're getting um, you know, about 10% uh, uh, exceedance probability. So that's an important thing in terms of, of framing. And I, and I thought this is a quite, quite a good example in terms of uh, perception of risk. So after Hurricane Sandy, which was 2012 in northeast of the US, um, these uh, boats and can repair it out, the product of water, went out and interviewed residents in the area affected by Hurricane Sandy. And what they found was that framing the chances of a flood as being greater than one in five over 25 years, rather than one in 100, which is really the way that we, we, we tend to explain things, in any given year, could it impact that risk of perception and make property owners more likely to take flood risk seriously. So that's, uh, that, I thought it was quite a, quite, 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 quite a useful uh, result. And it's something that we in the insurance industry could then um, t t take on board. And, and, and I explain something similar to, to, to actually the opposite of this in a second on, on climate change. So one of the ob observations when communicating uh, climate change impacts, as I said, very, very um, hot and important topic right now. So once a number is communicated, the assumptions behind them are, are often lost. And the main thing I mean with that is with climate change, you, you're very certain about uh, certain things, right? You have very high confidence or more confidence in some things than other things, like sea level rise and <coughs> large scale systems are being hot and, and wet and so on. But very small scale things like tornadoes or hurricanes, you have a lot less confidence in. But you still need to quantify and, and, and put numbers to things to, in order to, 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 to get some understanding of what will happen uh, to, your, to, to your portfolio. But then when you do that, I think that, that, that idea of confidence then gets lost. You're not so confident, let's say, but you still need to do some testing. Um, and so that's what, that, that's what I mean with the um, assumptions can get lost. This last bullet point is a, is a really important one because this is really where, where regulators are, are moving in, in both Bank of England here in the UK and, and, and then also in Europe, which is looking at what's the overall impacts at some future time horizon. So they'll say in 2050 under some warming pathway, what's your, what's your um, loss going to be? And then you get some number, let's say, 60% change in loss. Now the difficulty there is that um, when these climate change estimations are done, um, they're really the only hazard changes. So you're really just changing some aspect of the event itself. You're making more storms, wetter storms, something like that. You're not changing anything else. You're not making buildings stronger or putting any defenses or changing exposure, et cetera. Um, and so one of the recommendations that we found is, is really annualizing this is quite, uh, quite useful. So instead of saying it's a 60% change in loss, by 2050, you also say, well, the year-on-year -year change is 1.5%. So that gives you an idea you can then compare that to the inflation, for example, um, exposure growth, wealth changes, and, and, and so on. And then the last thing, uh, so, so the penultimate thing um, I wanted to talk about was, was really then what are the recommendations? So I was asked to talk about a, a few things. So return periods and exceedance probabilities, yeah, providing both I think would be helpful. Uh, Maybe not quoting too many return periods, um, being very specific when you do and quoting larger areas like country level, these kind of things, rather than too many individual parts. Um, when you have multiple ways to look at um, loss metrics, having default and on, so seeing, seeing the way that the software and so forth is displayed. Um, when some cultures want one number, well, maybe one number with some uncertainty loading, uh, we saw, saw a reference before to um, something like a factor of safety, there's things called risk margins, these kinds of things can, can then load. Um, framing risk over one year, longer time frames are helpful. Um, education and assumptions are really important in figuring out what exactly what's represented in the results. And then finally, on the, uh, on the climate change side, being very specific in what uh, assumptions are there, trying to explain, I would love to hear more from, from this event, um, uh, confidence and how you represent confidence in also uh, numerical changes. Um, and finally, looking at uh, annualizing changes could also be helpful in putting it in the right frame of reference, which is a bit different to uh, the, the, the comment above. And then the last thing um, I want to talk about was some like, unsuccessful communication examples. I think we heard a lot about like pretty good successful <laughs> things. Uh, I want to show, it's, it's always nice and I just remember things that maybe are not so successful and also talk about <coughs> some successful ones. Um, 
So the first one is a really, a really common one. So an event is happening, there's a hurricane, and uh, the, it, 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 you want to know what's the loss going to be. And you say, well, the loss is 50 to 100 billion. Um, but in the end, when you go back to the market and you say, okay, so what was our loss estimate? They say 100 billion. They never say 50 to 100 billion, they always say 100 billion. They always take, 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 a, take a higher estimate of the range. Very, very common. Um, so that's an example of unsuccessful communication. The second one is on the uncertainty. You provide the ranges, but then you don't provide a context as how you could have got to the range and the reasonability. Oh, this is 100 billion, and that's because the hurricane hit Miami and was right hand side of the track, and that's where the winds are strong, and so on. And the 50 billion, well, it missed Miami and it went south. These kind of things. Otherwise, you just provide a range. So, you know, giving them a way to visualize, understand what's leading to these different outcomes, um, I, think, I think is quite helpful. A real example here. Um, on a successful communication, I would say it's Hurricane Ian, which has happened um, in, in, in the US for tens of billions of dollars um, of, of, of damage. And a good example of successful communication is, you know, you hear back reflect the assumptions that are made. So they'll say, oh, you know, we, heard, we see your Hurricane Ian losses, but we know that it does not include, you know, losses to the National Flood Insurance Program or whatever. And, we, and, and some of the comments are, oh, it's really good that you do that now. It's quite funny, we've been doing that for 35 years. Um, it's just that that part was at the bottom and now it's at the top, right? When they see, when they see that, and it's in the press release um, as well. Um, using the five tools as much as possible, I talked about that. And then I'll spend a little bit, the, the, the last bit of time, really talking about um, how, we, how you communicate. So one thing that we've found is what we're talking about is really complicated. Um, and you might say, well, you know what? To be really precise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my documentation and so forth. I'm going to respond by email. I'll be very precise. And you know, after many years, you kind of realize that verbal communication is, is often a lot more helpful. Um, one of the reasons um, the insurance market might say is, well, sometimes they don't want to put things in writing. That's one of the reasons. Um, so it's easier to just speak rather than putting things in writing. Um, but I would say it's less about that. Um, it, it's more that text is finite and a conversation is inter infinite. So that's why very often when things happen, we have to have so many meetings instead of calls with our clients because then it's much more infinite rather than you know, doing, doing things via text and then following, following up by email. And the last thing is just spending your valuable time to be part of the process. So you, you, you don't want to lose control of the narrative, but sometimes you just don't have time. You just, just say, well, here's a document, and you send it to the, um, to the, the journalists, and then they can just do, do, do their thing. But spend, if you have the time, spending, spending the time is, is helpful. It helps you to own a narrative. Otherwise, you, that, might, uh, that might run away from you. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much.